Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Misha and I work with Early Bird, which is an initiative to bring people closer to nature through birds. And we do that um, in various ways. We create content like pocket guides, posters, activity booklets, flashcards about birds. We also do workshops to help educators become bird educators. And we also do direct outreach, like nature walks, workshops, or um, online sessions like these to help spread the joy of uh, watching birds. And I also have my colleague Varsha here with me today uh, to help with the session. We've kept everybody on mute to avoid confusion, but the chat box is open. So at any point, if you have any questions uh, or anything to say, uh, please type it in the chat box. We have a section towards the end of the session for question and answers. So Isha will take your questions uh, towards the end. And you can, again, type them in the chat box. Uh, this session is also going live on YouTube. So if any of your friends are not able to join the Zoom meeting, they can also go to uh, the YouTube uh, live and uh, watch the session from there. So today we have with us Aisha. Hi, Aisha. Hi. <laughs> thank, you. thank you for joining us. Aisha is the founder of the Feather Library. She's an architect, a bird watcher, and a citizen scientist. She came up with the idea of creating a reference library of feathers to be able to identify birds from their feathers. And because no such reference was available for India, she uh, started to document flight feathers from dead birds. And she noted the number of primary, secondary, tertials. We'll get to know about what these terms mean in the course of the session. And she started creating a digital library with photographs. And at present, she's the associate curator at NCBS in Bangalore. NCBS is the National Center for Biological Sciences. And today she's going to talk to all of us about her journey of creating the Feather Library, the importance of such a library. And uh, she's also gonna show us some specimens from the collection. So welcome Isha. Thank you so much for taking the time out to do this today. And over to you. Thanks so much, Misha. Uh, it's a privilege to be uh, part of this amazing thing which you are doing and uh, yes thank you all so much for attending today's talk um, so uh, feather library I think it's uh, pretty much clear and as Misha introduced me uh, I think that was quite in detail but I'll just uh, still say some things about me uh, so as Misha said that by education, I'm an architect. I practice architecture for 15 years. Uh, I've been bird watching for over a decade now. And I've seen around 1,072 species from Indian subcontinent, uh, more worldwide. But uh, if we just talk about the Indian birds. Uh, while uh, bird watching, I got in also interested in uh, the sound recording of uh, birds. Uh, I did a certificate course uh, at NCBS back in 2019, which was held by Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Uh, so I think a lot of my recordings you can find in Merlin app. And uh, I'm also working as a sound annotator for the app to identify the sounds. Uh, as it's very clear, I'm the founder of Feather Library and uh, I went to Cornell and uh, I learned uh, how to do this properly. I'll talk about my journey in detail as we talk. Uh, so I would open my chat box and here are a few birds. I think most of them are known to most of you. Uh, my question here is, what are the things by which we can identify different species? 
so this is like a collage of different species, different families. Uh, how do we uh, identify different species? What are the key features? What, what do we look for? Can you uh, just uh, type in the chat box quickly, like in next few seconds? Feathers, yes. Calls, yes. Habitat, perfect. Size. Yes. Yeah. Beaks, eggs, behavior, perfect. Uh, yes. Um, what they eat, true. Looks, yes. What we are looking at, right? From the pictures, we can know the basic. Ha. Huh. So from the pictures, what we can see are the feathers and the basic size and the beaks, the variation in beaks, um, and so on, right? All these are all these things which we use to identify different species from each other. Now, uh, I'll show you another. Uh, yeah, we are just talking about the photos here and not the nest or the eggs or the further research of it. Um, I'll show you another set of photos and can anyone tell me uh, how do we identify between these two species? Both are cursors. Um, both have similar beaks. Both have similar patterns. Both have similar legs in this case. Um, Plumage, feathers, plumage, color. Yes, eyes, eyes are similar in this. Uh, gender, I don't think it will be known. This is not a gender difference. These, these two are two different species. One is a cream colored cursor and one is an Indian cursor. So, uh, size is almost a similar size. There is no... all no major difference in size where it lives yes but from if you have to identify from the photographs itself i show you this photograph how what is the main key feature with which you can identify that this is a cream colored cursor and this is an indian cursor yeah yeah so body shape right the colors on the body are slightly different. The head pattern is slightly different, right? And if you see an Indian cursor, there is black even in front of the eye. And uh, yeah, head pattern that has a russet head. This has like a mixed color. Yes. So colors and all those colors, except for the beak, eyes and legs are feathers. A bird would look something like this if it was without any feathers. And I have no idea which bird is this. You can't, I mean, it would be just too difficult to identify the species unless or until you do the DNA testing and all those things, right? So this is a bird without feathers. And so that much important uh, role the feathers play when it comes to birds. Um, so we can say that feathers are what makes a bird a bird. Yeah, it looks like a dinosaur, right? Yeah. So uh, basically, feathers are what makes a bird a bird. Uh, Salim Ali uh, said that uh, they are known as feathered bipeds. So they are bipeds like humans, but they are feathered bipeds. And there is one another thing uh, which I would like to explain here that uh, a lot of uh, other uh, animals from the animal kingdom, they lay eggs, they make nest, they have some of the other version of beaks, uh, they can fly, they can do all those things. But feathers are the only thing which is uniquely avian. 
that means that feathers are the only thing which which is only there in a bird so if you find a feather without a doubt it would be coming from a bird and no other animals in the entire animal kingdom so of all the things which birds also do only feathers are there alone that much important feathers are uh, when we talk about uh, birds and i'm sure we all are pretty crazy about birds so uh, i think in this session what i'm going to try and do is, is like um, think from think about a bird from a feathers point of view um and this is another thing which i think we all have noticed that um, who has done that just raise your hand so i would know that if you see a feather uh, lying on the ground you would pick it up i've seen children doing that i've seen adults doing that i myself have uh, i've done that and uh, i i'm sure everyone would be you know curious about okay th this is something interesting this is something i want to see how it's made what are the colors what bird it could be uh, belonging to and what part of the uh, body it would be i get so many questions now since i have started feather library like people just send me photographs that you know uh, what do you think uh, what is this feather and that's i think that's a human curiosity which runs from children to adults to old people also they are also very fascinated with feathers that whenever they go for a walk i have seen my own uh, grandfather do it and uh, he would just tell me when i was young he would pick up a feather and tell me okay you see this is a pick up feather and all those things very human uh, curiosity based uh, things so i think feathers are a very important part when it comes to curiosity as children adults whatever the age we are right um also um i'll just share uh, an incident which triggered me to start the feather library was that uh, it was locked down and there were more birds around we were all inside and i have got pet cats at home which are house cats so don't worry they don't go out and hunt um so i've got four layers of mosquito uh, uh pigeon nets uh so that the birds don't come inside and my cats don't because i live on the fourth floor so for the safety of my cats and the for, for the for the safety of the birds i have like four layers of bird net installed and during the lockdown there was this pair of silver bill on a tree nearby and i think they were more or less there uh one fine day one silver bill somehow managed to cross all four layers of bird net and tried to come inside and my female cat saw it the cat ran to it i ran to it and uh, luckily i could let the bird free uh, but when i held the bird bird tend to do that in fright they lose their feathers it's like uh, everyone knows about lizard uh, losing its tail right to avoid predation so birds can also do that if uh, there is uh, a predatory threat they they can lose their they are able to lose uh, the feathers which are in the grip especially the flight feathers um so in my hand i had like three feathers of indian silver bill and this feather which is the outermost feather of the wing is you can see in the uh, measurement here that it's around 4 and 1/2 cm so which is like this much like around my little finger size and which is like quite tiny so uh, i i was just looking at it and i was looking at this pattern you see this pattern here i was looking at this pattern here and it got me really curious that such little bird has got such fascinating feathers and of course 
being like uh, burning for so long. I had seen silver bills so many times, but I had never seen it in this point of view that, oh my God, the flight feathers of silver bill are so beautiful. And we all know about uh, all the birds around us, right? We capture uh, birds in flight and we see the beautiful feathers. Some are very colorful, some the raptors, which are barred and, you know, all those things. So I wanted to know the spectrum between this and let's say the largest uh, flight feather which can be found in India, which I don't know what it is, maybe some vulture, uh, Sinitas vulture, I guess, but uh, we don't know about feathers yet. Uh, wingspan, yes, but feathers is a whole new story as you will come to it, uh, come to know about it. So, um, yeah, so I, I wanted to know about this entire spectrum. That, okay, if this tiny silver bill has got such fantastic dual coloration and all these patterns in it, then what would be the case for the more colorful birds or uh, larger birds or raptors or owls? And I tried to uh, search for it and I could find one website which was only for North American birds which talked about feathers as feathers, flight feathers. Um, and one is based in uh, Germany, but that website is made up of uh, several people's collections. So it does not have all the Indian birds. Um, for example, bar-headed goose, it had only three feathers, which they found somewhere randomly like that, picked up from somewhere. And it was in someone's... Uh, personal collection uh, so I thought that this this detail where do I know all these things from and I could not find an answer and trust me I was free it was during lockdown so I did good research about it and I could not find anything about Indian birds so I thought that uh, if there's nothing like that then why don't I create something like that which can lead curiosity in others also and that, that can fulfill that curiosity. They have a place to go to see all these things, to learn more about birds, to, more, to learn more about the aspects of birds which we generally don't see, right? And uh, that's how the Feather Library came into existence and... I think I never thought about the name, what to name the website. I was pretty clear from the day one in my head. I had been thinking about this for one year before I said it out loud in front of anyone. Uh, but I knew it that it's going to be called Feather Library because it's simply an online library of feathers. An online resource of feathers. So I, I, I think not for a single second I had any uh, doubts or anything. I always called it Feather Library in my head. That it's a Feather Library. It's a library of feathers. And it's online because I wanted to share it with everyone. So that, uh, because at that time I was a uh, practicing architect, a bird watcher, like the most of you, uh, interested in knowing more. And I didn't know any where I could go, right? So I wanted it open for all, that anyone with the interest can see it, uh, share it, compare it, learn more about it, and so on, right? So that's how the Feather Library came into existence. Okay, now uh, this is a pretty standard uh, first bird image uh, and all these are I think most of you know the terms which are mentioned here about the different body parts of the birds and uh, that's very important because uh, a lot of birds are named after that the color of that particular body part right so uh, ashy crown sparrow lark right um, black naped monarch, uh, white rumped vulture, rufous tailed lark, uh, red breasted flycatcher, red throated flycatcher, uh, red vented bulbul, 
uh, I'm just naming the common words, but yeah. Uh, so basically, uh, except the beak, eye and legs, everything you see in this picture is made up of feathers. And one cannot imagine the variation of feathers are there in one single individual. Um, that's how important feathers are. So all these parts, lower and crown and supercilium and coverts and nape and back and rump and vent and throat and everything is made up of feathers and then there are feathers inside it. Uh, even the thighs are made up of feathers, tiny feathers. Uh, so except uh, this beak here, this eye here, even the eye ring is a type of a feather, uh, sometimes a combination of feather and skin. Uh, but uh, more or less, like I, I can easily say that 95% of the bird you can see here is our feathers different of different shapes sizes colors functions everything that's how important feathers are when it comes to birds um so let's uh misha can we do a poll here uh i thought it would be interesting to guess that how many feathers are there on one single bird okay so uh, misha are you there yeah, I'm okay. going to launch. Huh. Cool. So my first question is, the smallest bird in the world, which is a bee hummingbird. And it is this tiny, okay? It is literally this much, if you can see me. Okay, it, if, it's sit, it, if it's sitting on my finger, it would be this much. So how many feathers do you think a bee hummingbird would have. So the poll would have appeared on everybody's screens and you can start uh, voting. For the first question, how many feathers does a bee hummingbird have? So, the answer is th around 1,000 feathers for the smallest bird in the world. Okay. This little bird has got 1,000 feathers stuffed in it. Whether you can see it or not. And 1,000 feathers, trust me, it's a huge number when you're talking about a bird this small. Okay. Uh, now we'll talk about one of the larger birds, trumpeter swan. Yeah. How, how many feathers do you think a trumpeter uh, swan would have? So the second question in the poll, if you scroll down, it says, how many feathers does a trumpeter swan have? Okay. A lot of people are saying... Around 50% of the people are saying 25,000. Which is the correct answer. <laughs> Some of them. And uh, yeah, it's the, I mean, just imagine 25,000 individual feathers on one single bird. And there are millions of billions of birds in this world. Just imagine the number of feathers we have to look at, right? Okay. Uh, I'll just close the poll here from my end. So that, yeah. Okay. Now, when we spoke about all these numbers of feathers on a single bird, right? So, uh, let's see how many types of feathers there are in one bird. 
so each bird has this. Uh, first is the wing feather, uh, tail feather, which I think pretty much is obvious. I think everyone would know about it, which are called flight feathers, which are used for the avian flight, right? And uh, without them, the bird cannot fly. Simple, flight feathers. Then there are contour feathers, which looks like this if you find a feather lying somewhere alone without the bird. Uh, and down feather. I think everyone, I think everyone would in their house will have this uh, very fluffy white down feather of a pigeon flying somewhere. Right. I think most of you would have seen that it would be like a feather, but it would be like all very soft. Like we used to blow it off with our hands. And I think all of us would have done that. And that's a down feather of a pigeon because we have pigeons in, around us in the urban areas. Um, but all birds have this. Uh, and they are called body feathers. The less known types of feathers are bristles, which is called a bristle feather. And just a second, I'll move this and phyloplume. Both of these are sensory feathers. Now, what I mean by sensory feathers is that when we when something hurts us, we have got our nervous system connected to our skin, right? And that sends the message to our brain that, uh, okay, this has happened here and you need to do the needful. Uh, feathers generally, after they grow completely, are dead structures like hair and nails. Uh, we, we all have seen like quills like this, right? So this is dead. This is hollow. And this feather structure is dead. There's no life in this. It can't repair itself, right? Uh, when I held the silver bill, it lost three feathers in fright. How would the silver bill know that, okay, I've lost these three feathers from this particular location and I have to send my proteins to that particular location to grow more feathers. Or when a bird is pecking or a night bird, like a nocturnal birds, uh, they sense things with their bristles, which does the same thing as uh, whiskers in kittens, uh, cats, uh, which gives them sensory, uh, uh, this thing of the surrounding and it sends the signal to the brain. So both these feathers are connected to the nervous system of the bird. And they are called the sensory feathers, which are very less known and very difficult to find, even if you have a bird on your in your hand. Okay, uh, I'll explain where they are and I'll explain a little bit more about all of this along with the specimens. Um, but be before that, let's just uh, talk basic about uh, what are feathers and how do they, uh, what are they made up of and how do they function? The simplest of the feathers of all, uh, I would just, for example, take this feather here, which is Indian eagle owl, by the way. Um, so this, the central shaft is called a rachis or rachis, how you pronounce it. Um, the part which does not have this, which is called veins, this part and this part where these things are, the feather is actual feather. Um, so this is called rachis and the part which does not have the vein 
is called a calamus, uh, which is from the base of the feather to the starting of the first barb, how we call it. Uh, so veins consist of, so each vein, each area in the vein, there are barbs, which are like this. And then there are barbules, uh, which are basically, they work like a, a zip or a Velcro. They interlock. So if I open this feather from here, now it's open, right? Why bird preen is also to close this and it just gets closed very easily because of that interconnection of barbs and barbules. So these are the fundamentals of any feather. Uh, also, the feathers, the down feather, the contour feather would have something like this, which is very uh, flimsy and not as connected because it the, the barbules in it are not uh, interlocking like the one in the vein, but they are more like this brown things shown below. And it has nodes in a microscopic uh, view. Uh, I'm sure you all can see. Misha, can you see? Yeah. Fluffy part. Yeah. Okay. So that depends uh, from uh, on also, it also depends on which type of feather it is. For example, these are the contour feathers. This is a tail covered of uh, Indian eagle owl. And I'll just, this is an extra, so don't worry. But I'll just take out one feather out of it. Huh. So now you see. So this has a little bit of connection at the top. And here the it's very flimsy and uh, it does not have that much of, uh, so it's a combination of down and contour. And so each uh, part of the body of the bird has a different type of feather, a different kind of feather, uh, different ratio of barbs and barbules and uh, patterns and uh, so if you see this, which is just a leftover from the tail covers, you can see how many patterns of feathers there are. There are some down feathers, which you can see flimsy ones. Uh, there are some very neat feathers you can see here. Um, generally, the, these gray ones, which are below this, are the down feathers. Um, they are generally there in the below the uh, contour feathers. So. I'll just take another example from the same specimen if I can. But no, I cannot. It's all dried. But you see the pattern changes quite drastically between the feathers. And uh, yeah, so talking about coloration in feathers. Uh, why? this color why these color in a parakeet tail this is rose ring parakeet and uh, so uh, in birds the colors come from uh, pigments which are like the pure colors they are manufactured within the cells as mentioned here and all these earthy colors, all these earthy colors, the, these, um, let's say this, this is a juvenile painted stork wing. So these colors, brown, black, um, all these are uh, made up of melanins and uh, other pigments. Uh, Carotenoids are something which comes to the in the feathers by their diet, which you must have uh, read about uh, flamingos, right? They eat something and that's how they get their pink colors and bright yellow 
uh, orange red pink all these are another type of pigments which are produced within the cells and it's just the color as we see it but there is something else also which is called a structural color for that i think the best example is this wing of an indian pitta now you see this blue the color blue there is no uh, pigment for color blue so whatever blue and especially this shiny blue and if you would have seen in ducks it changes as you change the angle right see it changes the color as you change the angle it's a combination of melanin keratin and the air within the feather cells itself and it's a whole science in itself but the point here is that the color in feathers are either from pigments or from structure or from a combination of both of them which in most cases like for example if it's green then it's structural blue pigment yellow which we see as green okay so it's like a combination of an coloration in feathers coloration in birds is a whole new science in itself and it's a four dimensional color uh, and all those thing we don't want to get into that but these are the pretty basics of how why such color where you know it's shiny uh, to something looking so drab um or i wouldn't say drab but earthy uh this is a wing of an indian eagle owl so even this white is sometimes structural uh blacks are generally melanin because melanin is the strongest pigment and it's more, it's it's quite often used for the flight feathers because flight needs the strength so i'll show you an example where you would not believe that all the wing feathers are black in that bird i'll show you that example in some time um so let's talk about flight feathers a bit it as it's pretty clear wing feathers um which are in both the wings which are almost identical on both the sides like um uh, and tail feathers it's quite a uh, self explanatory but there are some tails or some wings which have special adaptations for various purpose for uh, sexual selection for uh, uh better uh, to be mostly for sexual selection but i would say yeah when i'm thinking about it mostly it's for sexual selection but uh, yeah this feather here is of a wire tail swallow can you see the wires yeah very tiny wires so very difficult to see but yes so this is an entire feather the last feather of a vital swallow uh so this feather has got uh, an adaptation in which the the rachis extends beyond this feather and becomes a long wire it's not that the wires are separate from the feathers it's just the last feather which is made that way in case of bee eaters or uh parakeets uh we see that the central feather is a uh, longer colorful uh so all these are different types of tails uh, adaptations in tails shapes of tails woodpecker tails are some something completely different um 
in case of this owl most of you know that owls are a silent flyer you can one one quick um maybe feedback you can probably stop sharing your screen so that everybody can see just your video and a bigger view of uh, the wing okay you can do that uh stop share now yeah yeah better? Yes, much better ha huh. so you see these serrations so that is what makes the owl's silent flyer that and the softness of these uh, feathers trust me if anyone is in bangalore and they want to come here and see this and touch this you'll realize what i'm talking about because in one hand i have got this painted stock which is like so brittle feathers and you can feel you can hear the sound right you see the difference so lot of variations both in wing and uh, tail feathers now uh, i'll have to share screen again ha huh. now talking about the a little technical aspect of that is a uh, uh, in feathers there are numbers in flight feathers especially and uh, we will come to that when we see the i'll show you the feather library how it is designed uh, also at the museum here at ncbs you'll see all these numbers okay it's everywhere and uh, that is the uh, numberish numbering uh, practice for uh, all the flight feathers almost everywhere across the world and uh, the the reason the, the the idea behind that number is first i will explain with my hand uh, so we have one bone from the shoulder to the elbow one bone from elbow to wrist and from wrist to the hand right so there are three bones even in the bird in the wing there are three bones one is from here to here second is from where my hand is to where my other hand is so the, there are actually two bones here and the third is here which are the digits which is called which we have as our fingers so the feathers connected to the hand part of our equivalent are called primaries you see this joint i am moving that joint and all these feathers which are moving along with that joint are called primaries the feathers which are connected from the wrist to the elbow are called the secondaries and the tertials are the joining feather along with the body feathers of the bird this bone Uh, this bone which is our shoulder to our uh, elbow is generally inside the bird's body which is somewhere here if you can see my cursor right so and also there is a reason why so the, basically here i opened the wing completely okay so you you'll see this notch in most of the uh wings you'll see this notch here uh like this generally that is where the outside is primaries the insides are the secondaries if i show you like this outsides are primaries insides are secondaries and tertials okay uh now why one starts from here and also here why primary one starts from here why secondary one starts from here there is a very interesting uh, reason for numbering feathers like that we'll come to that in one second before that i'll explain the rectices which are the tail feathers so this is a tail of a rosewing parakeet and as you can see it's almost identical on both the sides there are uh, 
six feathers on each side and they are like they fan like this when the bird flies right so in tail the numbering starts always from one set center to outwards so there is uh, i have to <laughs> okay so th this is left rectrices right rectrices so both of these center ones will have the number r1 on it okay like this and then as you go out it will be r2 r3 4 5 6 and so on the reason for this is that when a bird molts uh, those of uh, you who do not know what molting is can you please raise your hand what is molting okay so as we discussed earlier feathers are a dead structure like hair right so uh, if we cut our hair it the scalp would not know that the hair has been cut it will keep on growing but in feathers there is a clear cut demarcation that when it fully grows it just becomes dead from here and then it is detached from the follicle which is the from where the feather emerges and it doesn't basically it cannot repair itself as i said earlier for example this feather so as you can see this feather is already damaged uh, that is because of all these transportation between and the bath and here but uh, even uh, in birds, because of wear and tear, because of, as we discussed, fly, uh, fright, uh, all these things, feathers get damaged and they are pretty delicate uh, things anyway. So each bird uh, changes the entire set of feathers and replaces it with new ones. And that process is called molting. Now, uh, when we are talking about molting of flight feathers, it has to be done in a way that the flight of the bird would not be compromised, because otherwise it will be very uh, it will be very vulnerable to predation and all the other things. Right? If the bird cannot fly, uh, it becomes a problem. So, when the bird starts molting. Generally, it starts, I'll just explain in this diagram. So the first feather to start molting are these two. The first primary and the first secondary. And then it molts. So here, if you see in this diagram, the, there's this new first primary and secondary. Second, second, secondary two is almost grown. Secondary two is fully grown. Primary three is halfway grown. This has just be, this is just being grown as we like just started. Even this has just started. So basically, it molts from one feather at a time, inside to outside. Similarly, in the tail, it starts from the center. The tail is like that. First feathers to molt will be this. These will be intact, and then one by one it would start molting outwards. And that's why this numbering system where we talk about, um, how do I go to the previous slide? Huh. And that's why this numbering system of primary one, so P1, P2, P3, P4, P5, et cetera, S1, S2, S3, and R1, R2, R3, R4. And there are two sets of R. And these, Feathers here are called alulas, uh, which are, uh, if you know, in some lap wing, they have spur, uh, like a claw. Uh, that has been uh, during the evolution because for the landing of the bird, the alulas are very important. And uh, if I can show you in this wing, which is very difficult. No, not this wing. 
and uh, search for a better example where it's clearer. Yeah, here. Yeah. So this is the wing of a rose ring parakeet. So as you can see, uh, again, there's a notch here. So you can guess that these are the primaries. These are the secondaries and tertials. And you see these, I'll stop sharing for one second. Um, as you can see, these feathers here, there are three feathers here. These three, they are called aludas. And they are a major identification feature in many of the birds. Um, also, they are very useful. So they are also part of the flight feather. Of, of course, it's part of the wing. But they are very useful when it comes to uh, breaking the flight and landing. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, this is pretty much how a wing, standard wing, would look like. And I'll just, yeah, right. So, as we spoke about P1 to P whatever, S1 to S whatever, and generally primaries are 10. Uh, but there, has, there are exceptions depending on the flying capacity. Uh, uh, a lot of um, factors basically play a role in that. But let's talk about this painted stork. And this is a classic example. Actually, this is a very old specimen, which is now gone. But I use it to show this. And uh, it's very useful because if, we could, if you count the primaries, okay. So this, this is where the primaries here, okay. So there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven primaries. Okay, which is an exception. Generally, primaries are ten. Uh, they can vary between nine to eleven in special cases because of the functions, flight functions. Um, some birds which are short flyer, they tend to have nine primaries. Uh, similar, similar things for secondaries also. So uh, I'll again start share my screen. And uh, so, yeah, this is all about flight feathers we are talking about, right? Now, the thing is, uh, contour feathers and down feathers the body feathers which we spoke about. So I would explain this. I have a very nice uh, way of, I love that uh, example. But it's like uh, everyone, uh, so we have uh, down jackets, right? So it has filling of down feathers inside, which is for insulation. And the fabric on top, whatever the fabric is, that job is done by the contour feathers to keep the shape to make the contour of the bird however whatever is necessary to create this shape the contour feathers are there on the top and the down feathers are inside for the insulation these two are the and contour feathers are very easy to see in today's day because when we photograph a bird or when we see a bird, all we see mainly are the contour feathers uh, because the flight feathers are here and here. So as you can see, it's you can't see the actual details like we saw in all these uh, examples, right? Which I which I showed you. Now um, let's quickly talk about the bristles and phyloblooms. What we spoke about uh, bristles, as you can see in this night jar quite thick bristles it has there are there are bristles here also and um, owls night jars barbets they tend to have bristles phyloplumes are these sensory feathers which sends this uh, message to the bird that uh, this feather is not present so each 
flight feather has a set of phylloplume which is the smallest feather in a bird's body there's a set of phylloplumes and these are the sensory feathers so if this feather is removed from here this phylloplumes connected to the nervous system would send the message that this feather is not there even during molting and in any case the feather is not there when a flight feather is not there because flight is very ne very necessary for a bird so these phylloplumes are very important as far as functioning of a bird is concerned but they are the least known feathers because no one can see it because they are inside this inside this at the base where the these feathers are meeting the skin so this photo of a specimen which i shot at cornell was specifically made to have research on phylloplumes right so i'm right now working on the phylloplumes of indian birds i am doing a research on that because i want to know more about that along with feather library um yeah so in 19th and 20th century this is how all the museum drawers would look like uh this is a photo which these are these are all north american birds this is a photo which i took at cornell when i was there and they are all like this stuffed bird uh, uh like beak stretched out legs tied and wings and tail both folded at the back and the bird is laid on the back this is very good for measuring the basics of the bird but the details of the flight feathers is lost in this because once it is dried like that you cannot open it again uh, it will just break and you cannot see the feathers you cannot see the flight feathers or all these uh, uh, patterns and phylloplumes and tail and all those things but the good news is now we don't need that many museum specimens we have science has already described almost all the birds thanks to those museum specimens now we just take photographs we can identify the birds um and we can see the contour feathers which are here 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 everywhere but there is a problem that supply of new specimen is uh, is decreasing so there is this graph uh, made by uh, national museum of natural history in washington dc which has the largest species collection in the world that in 1960 was the maximum number of uh, specimens all types of specimens uh, skins eggs nests skeletons etc etc were collected Uh, but still you can if you can see from this graph the skins are the most and still no one is talking about wing or flight or uh, flight feathers or tail feathers or anything like that we are still talking about uh, till 2010 we are talking about skins so which can be now very easily very easily can be documented with help of a camera and uh, we have recording devices and sounds and so many other things right so now i think the what we need is a new supply of a new type of specimens which are the feather specimens and the answer to that is are the rescue centers which are there across india so the entire collection of feather library right now what you are seeing is from one rescue center based in ahmedabad uh, there are some statistics that in past 6 months 200 birds could not survive whatever the injury ailment poisoning whatever the reason is uh, but this is these are the number of the birds which cannot survive uh, so half of them cannot survive they cannot be released back to the wild um uh, so that's like 400 500 uh dead birds per year in one rescue center and we are talking about feather specimens or whatever specimens 
400, 500 without doing any further damage because they have been uh, post-mortem and they have been declared dead. If we connect to 50 re rescue centers across India, we can, uh, for Indian science, we can create 20,000 to 25,000 new specimens per year from what is already uh, is being used as a waste. So the birds which cannot survive, they are either buried or they are uh, burned, they are thrown away. Uh, but if we can get data out of this, then this is the amount of new specimens which we can create per year uh, for science. And that's where Feather Library comes in, that Feather Library only, we only document the flight feathers of the bird, which are the wings uh, and the tail, and the feathers are returned back to the rescue center. Uh, then if the rescue center wants to send the feathers to the museum like NCBS for further research and analysis, some of them send it to SACON, some of them send it to NCBS, some of them send it to BNHS, but it has to be a museum in order to store these feathers. So once we digitize it, we return the specimens back to the rescue centers. They can either throw it away or they can donate it to a museum for further research and analysis what we are doing here right now at NCBS. Uh, I'll quickly... Uh, walk you through the Feather Library website. So if you go to featherlibrary.com, that's a very simple name. And uh, you can open any specimen. Let's see the rose ring paracket, which we saw was something like this. And uh, before uh, taking out the feathers, all the details of the birds are uh, like they do it old times, old school times for the round skins, uh, weight, wingspan, uh, length, head length, uh, total length, uh, legs, uh, date of death, reason of death, which is very important for conservation, uh, whether it's poison, whether it's uh, trauma, so pet trades, uh, whether it's uh, injury, vehicular impact, fan impact, window impact, all these things can be found out from looking at the uh, dead specimen, which is a very important conservation data in itself. Um, but uh, yeah, any specimen you open, and this is the data which you will find for almost all the specimens. And uh, I'll show you my favorite specimen, which is Eurasian Pupu, because I love the pattern on it. It has all the dimensions, it has the crest length and everything. So whatever bird-wise details are required, the dimensions are taken. And then a plate is created like that with one wing intact and uh, one wing dismantled and the tail dismantled. But before doing that, we also take photos of the fan tail to see how the pattern overlaps within when the bird the tail is intact how the full wing is uh and you can see this has some very beautiful uh patterns on it and uh, if you see the master plate you'll be able to see all the feathers at once uh flight feathers um if you go down there will be dorsal view so dorsal is the back, ventral is the, so dorsal is the top, ventral is the under wing. So uh, this is dorsal view of Indian eagle owl wing. This is ventral view. And uh, in most of the cases, you can see the pattern highly changes if you see it from here and if you see it from here. And, uh, and then there is a, macro view. So let's, for comparison, let's just open Indian Eagle Owl and open 
of specimen and if you can see that. So this is the dorsal view and you can see the serrations here very clearly. And this is a ventral view. This is the same wing which I'm holding in my hand right now. Uh, I just have one specimen, so I'm pretty sure of it. But uh, yeah, so all these patterns are completely different when they are on the bird and when you see them individually. So that is how Feather Library is designed. Uh, you can also compare between specimens. For example, Rose Ring Paracket, I'll go again. I'll click on any specimen. And if you want to see that uh, the P10, the outermost primary, and if you just click compare, it will give you a comparison amongst all the specimens showing the length of feathers and the uh, other, if there are any, uh, what do you call, aberrations or anything like that. We have not come across that much so far. But uh, again, there is one very interesting uh, uh, comparison where this is an Indian scopsol fledgling and this is an adult Indian scopsol bird. So if you compare the tail feathers in this, the rectrices, for example, right? This is the adult bird. And I'll just go to the rectrices. And if I do compare, you can see that this is 80 mm and this is 27.8 mm. That's like three centimeters and eight centimeters. So comparison between genders, comparison, comparison between ages, comparison between different specimens is all we are looking for to gather more information about that particular bird and to answer so many unanswered research questions. Like I have got like thousands of them in my head already while working with these specimens. So uh, what we are looking for is the future uh, specimen, which uh, Mike Webster says as the extended specimen where you have one bird, you have its extended wing, you have its DNA. With today's technology, you can have an X-ray, CT scan, sound, uh, ectoparasites, which are there in the feathers, the food, which is there in their gut, the sex of the bird, the base, basic uh, dimensions of the birds, everything packed in, in one extended specimen. And that, that is the future what we are looking for at Feather Library. Uh, that soon we will be able to contribute more to science if we can just use this data, which is generally known as trash or they dump it, we can gather some very important uh, scientific data out of that. And uh, if anyone wants to read something more about the feathers, or uh, anything, then these are the books I go to. These are my go-to books all the time. I keep on reading them over and over. Uh, they are very important as far as feathers are concerned, the basic understanding, the extended understanding of feathers are concerned. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aisha. That was extremely insightful and like packed with information. Like, I'm sure a lot of us look at feathers from a completely different and new perspective now. Yeah. Uh, we'll take some questions now. So if anybody has any questions, uh, you can either raise your hand or type your question in the chat box. Okay. So Nishand is asking, why only flight feathers? Uh, as I said that till now in the collections, till now we have got many collections which in which we can see the contour feathers and everything else. Uh, all these museums, the largest of the museums, they have just started making the extended wings. So for most of the birds, we don't have the details of the flight feathers. Uh, and that's why the focus is on flight feathers. But yeah, someday if we... Fingers crossed, if we grow that much, we would like to see all the feathers of all the birds and we can give an exact answer that, okay, this bird has this many feathers. Somewhere between 1,000 to 25,000 as we discussed. Yeah. 
Wow. Uh, no, you cannot buy this. This is strictly, this belongs to the museum. Uh, it does, does not even belong to me. Uh, you can't keep it. You can't buy it. It's strictly, strictly, strictly against the law. Um, actually, it's against the law even to keep one feather uh, personally. So uh, when I was uh, starting Feather Library, uh, I had several meetings with BCCFs and all those authorities. And they said that uh, personally, they cannot give me the permission to do that. So it's a trust. It's a charitable trust. It's an NGO. Uh, Feather Library is, is an NGO, um, the Rescue Center is an NGO, and the Rescue Center then sends feathers to the museum, and I have been connected with NCBS, I am the curator, though I know these things, but uh, it has to ha follow us, a channel, and no one can own, these are all trophies, so if you, if they find this in your house, you can go behind bars, that's as simple it can be so no no can't buy it can't sell it can't keep it uh, wow that was new information <laughs> yeah okay uh anika is asking how many birds do you have in the feather library uh around 120 uh species with around 280 specimens. Some common birds are more uh, repetitive at rescue centers. So... So which are, just like a quick follow-up from my end, which are the most common birds that you come across in the rescue? Uh, so what, the general urban birds, uh, I'm talking about Gujarat and not Bangalore, but... Uh, Spotted Owlet, uh, Common Vaina, Rose Ring Parakeet, Shikra. Uh, yeah, I mean, these are some of the few which come quite often. Uh, Orva, you have, uh, what do you mean by what they've done to those poor stuffed birds? That's how the science developed uh, of... Uh, the birds, what we know today about birds is a lot of things have come from those drawers uh, all across the world. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's how they used to do. Uh, that's how they... it still must be like really, really cruel to like. Yeah, but in earlier times, people used to, I mean, till 1900s. In fact, till 1950. And how did you get Sali Mali, Sali Mali, the, the, the fall of a sparrow, it was shot. Yeah, right? and how did you get those specimens, those feathers that you showed us? Is it? Those feathers that you showed us, those specimens that those they are, they are what uh, have been died at the rescue center because of some uh, illness or injury or something like that. Oh, okay. Yeah. So they have. What would happen if they? Uh, and uh, one more thing. There's this in my house itself. There's this huge garden we live in Dehradun, in a valley. So I'd like to say that there are at least two bird nests. There were because one of them there were chicks. There was a chick. There were two parents, and then there was a storm, and suddenly they left okay. for some reason. They were, it just wasn't there. Oh, Why? Because they have abandoned the nest because of the storm, because they, they thought that they would not be able to take care of the uh, chicks. Uh, so sometimes birds but do the... It was so young, it couldn't fly. So how did they take it? it they might not have taken it. It might not have survived. So no, you, saw the, can, you saw the Indian... I saw into the nest. I saw into the nest and there was no, it was empty. Then it might have flown away. So, as you see, sometimes the chicks also cannot, uh, they also uh, come to the rescue centers. For example, uh, I showed you the uh, Indian scopsol fledgling, right? It was barely a fledgling. The feathers were still developing. It could not fly, but it still could not survive, right? But yeah, that but 
mine was basically just like that and the nest was at the height i had to use a ladder to see so i couldn't have uh maybe it got predated on or yeah, could be snakes by other organisms snakes uh, raptors crows so many things yeah and what was and and she have a bamboo tree and in the bamboo tree there is um a nest and there is a hummingbee ka hive as per what our gardener has told us so uh, will the bees affect the nest on the other side of the bamboo because i mean it's not such a big tree will it make a diary about it and share it to me with what happened yeah you'll do yeah. that thank you okay um nishant has said that now it is said that we have uh, uh, to leave what is what we see in nature there itself and then how can we have specimens and therefore these specimens are not collected from the nature they have collected from the rescue center where they have come from treatment and they could they could not survive the treatment and they have been declared dead by qualified vets that this was the cause of death which is also a very important aspect and this is why they could not survive but they are not uh, uh, they are not in nature they are not collected from the nature they are collected from the rescue center when they have they have entry they have death certificate they have all those there is a whole procedure so that's how we can have specimens uh what is the specific difference in owl feathers for their silent flight ah this as i showed you the serrations is what and the softness the serration wherever the so this is a very stiff specimen but when the it flies like that all the parts which are uh, uh, which uh, cuts the wing have these serrations so there are serrations here there are some serrations here it gets less and less as you come towards the inside but um, and yeah it's quite soft so yeah if you come to bangalore i can explain you more in detail but yeah that that, that is the main reason for them being a silent flyer these serrations and they are only there in the owl species and that also varies from species to species that how much serration in one feather is there uh, depending on the size of the owl uh, the the distance the owl flies if, if you know all these things there are so many factors it's not uh, black and white there are like thousand shades of gray so i can't say anything for sure but i mean there are so many shades of gray so uh, there's one question by karnika who asks from how many rescue uh, shelters in india are you able to source these feather specimens or just one for now one for now and that much i have got so just and my idea is to take this uh, that's my dream that we do we can do this india wise so we can uh, get uh, permission from all the states i'm i've already applied for permission in karnataka and uh, if i can get the specimen the rescue centers have agreed that once i have the letter they will be ready to give me the specimen so you have to apply to each state forest department to the highest authority and uh, get their permission in order to collect the specimens and after collecting the specimen there is a huge process of uh, what you are seeing is the end product which is there in the museum so don't get too excited about it, it it's a huge uh, lengthy process which goes in creating this specimens like any museum specimens yeah yeah i'm sure and the 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 second part of their question is uh, how can one contribute as a citizen scientist what contribution uh vs people yeah so soon uh weather library website will have uh that's the plan that's in pipeline that soon we will have a place where you can upload your feather photos if you can identify well enough otherwise we can do that for you and it can be an interactive citizen science uh, collaboration 
to know more about the feathers of the bird. So this part, this uh, very systematic part is separate, but we are also looking for a citizen science thing where you can uh, maybe show us, uh, maybe take photos of a roadkill you can, because you can't pick up a roadkill, but you can take photo of the roadkill so you can upload your photos and maybe we can know more about uh, uh, all across India of various birds and then we can uh, take it somewhere together. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Swapna is asking, are you also looking for specific microstructures in different types of feathers, specifically such as a bristle or a phylloplume? Yeah, so as I said, there has been, and I know it for a fact, there has been only one paper published scientifically on phylloplumes in the whole world. Uh, so yes, I am uh, creating specimens uh, specifically for phylloplumes and uh, maybe for a few 10 or so Indian species. Uh, belonging to various uh, genus, uh, maybe various families. I, have, I still have to figure that out, but various families and then maybe, yeah, someday we will have a Indian paper on phylloplumes of birds. That would be amazing, right? Yeah. Uh, no, I don't have any albino birds in the collection um, as yet, though I have a coffee brown uh, house crow so which is like part lucicism but not i mean somewhere in the, so the melanin is less so it didn't become fully black and it's like it's it's almost like this brown um uh, house crow uh, which my siri did not get but anyway <laughs> uh, is it in the feather library are the pictures in the feather library on no, the not yet? No, I want to put the photo of a proper specimen first and then put the uh aberrations after that. But yeah, uh, sometimes it happens that the common birds are the last least of your priorities, right? So yeah, house crow is still left, but uh, migratory birds, yes, I do have sooty tern, I do have uh, uh, gray leg geese uh, i have quite a few migratory birds actually are there on feather library as we speak some of them have been uploaded some of them are still work under progress here so yeah uh, is it possible to id a bird from photograph yes very much yes at least um you can get 90% closer if you see if you send a photo of a uh, fallen feathers, uh, if you have like flight feathers, then well and good. But yeah, you can get 90% of the idea what the species could be dep depending on the habitat, on the uh, area, location in India where th that feather is found. Because as you know, we have huge diversity of birds and that's why it's difficult but if we have uh, locations and all those things then yes it's 90 percent possible i don't have a hooded pitta i only have indian pitta uh i don't have asian emerald cuckoo i don't have i have only gujarat birds let's keep it at that uh so sumed is asking can we visit your feather library in person in, if you are in Bangalore, I can arrange for that. You can contact me. My contact is there on Feathered Library website. Um, next week, I'm not there. But uh, yeah, otherwise, I'm pretty much here. Uh, is it it is possible to ID a bird from photograph from Fitigar? You've already. Uh, that is like AI and AI training is going to take me like 100 specimens each. So that's like may, maybe the next generation of kids who are I'm seeing here, guys, please do that uh, when you grow up and uh, 
please take this further and create an AI which can just put, put this photo and it tells you that it's Indian Eagle Owl. So yeah, that's like way in future, way in future. Uh, if you are in Bangalore, you are most welcome to visit Feather Library. We just have to figure out with some permissions at the museum here, but I'm sure we'll be able to do that. Um, uh, Briti, uh, I cannot transfer the feathers from one state to the other without the prior permissions. So that also will be very difficult uh, for me to actually bring the feathers there to display. Uh, Indian laws are very difficult, uh, but contact me, we can figure something out uh, for Agartala. And uh, uh, Orva, I think uh, your bird, your questions for related to nestings and all those things, you should read Handbook of Bird Biology, uh, which is there in my uh, more reading list. Uh, it will give you answers to many of your questions. It talks about everything, almost everything scientifically related to birds. Uh, that that book is a bit tough to get though. Yeah, but uh, maybe you can catch hold of some libraries close to your house and see if there are other uh, books, you know, related to birds. But I think uh, just um, continue <laughs> observing birds. Yeah, like the way you already are right now will ultimately answer a lot of your questions. So keep going, like keep observing birds the way you do and keep being as curious as you are right now and sooner or later you'll be able to answer a lot of questions keep a diary or keep a, yeah. yes bolo yeah one second uh here yeah um i want to say that if if a bird like if, if there's a family of birds okay of bulbuls and their bulbul family has two chicks okay Will any, if any one of the chicks or any one of the parents die, say, then will it, will it, I mean, it will affect, but how will it affect? Because in front of my eyes, a bird has died. In front of my eyes, a chick has died, family of birds. So I want to know that that family flew, flew away, but how did it affect their lives in a long way? Did it? I think Misha, the question is to you. So, um, of course, see, birds put a lot of energy into making nests, into raising young. So if you're saying that they laid eggs, they made a nest and they uh, raised chicks and ultimately a storm destroyed it, so yes, they. I'm not talking about that. Uh, but, before okay. that, bulbuls. I, first of all, I asked that do birds come to a particular park? Because our, in our house there have been multiple nests, but all of them have been bulbuls, red vented bulbuls. Mm -hmm. So I want for that was one of my main causes for asking that question. The so, uh, what is your question again? Your question is: Do birds nest in a particular place? Is that what you're saying? No, say? my question is that uh, the the bulbul, how did how did the death of the raised chick, which was almost ready to fly, mm -hmm. how did that affect it? Because not the I'm talking about two of uh, two parents, mother, mm -hmm. father, mm -hmm. and two chicks. Mm -hmm. If one of the, the one one chick dies, mm -hmm. then how will it affect? the mother father remaining chick in the long run don't like the answer in birds it doesn't matter it would just focus on the other chick and it will keep on feeding it what yeah so in a oh. lot of birds what happens is there is sibling rivalry uh the parents may lay two or three eggs and they might have two or three chicks but there is rivalry and competition among the chicks and a lot of times the bigger chicks that are that hatch before the 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 eggs that hatch before the chick is bigger than the one that hatches maybe a week later or two or a couple of days later 
that bullies and dominates the younger chick. And a lot of times the younger chick actually even dies. And sometimes the parent also abandons the uh, uh, chicks. Yeah, they selectively feed the stronger and the bigger chicks. So that all kinds of... Survival, um, Survival of the fittest. Yeah, yeah, you can say it like that. So yeah, actually, Isha, the, the answer was perfect. That it, it won't affect it, it affect the bird to a large extent. It'll just go on feeding the other chicks. Yeah, Anika, you can collect. I mean, it's not legal, legal per se, but yeah, you can collect fe- fallen feathers. Yeah. Okay, uh, we're um, a little ahead of. Uh, yeah. The- Any last questions? We'll take one more question. I'll ask Varsha. Varsha, are there any questions on YouTube? Because we also went live on YouTube. So perhaps we can take some questions from there. Uh, yeah, Misha, we do not have any questions on YouTube. On YouTube. Okay. Yeah. So uh, for uh, I think we close it for now. And, uh, uh, like Isha said, her contact is on the Feather Library website. I did post the link in the chat box of of the website. I'm posting it again. It's simple. It's featherlibrary.com. It's not complicated. Also, feather underscore library is there on Instagram. Uh, You can follow us there. You can contact us there. You can contact us on email. So me and my co-founder, Sharvin, both of us would be ready to help you uh, for anything, any questions you have. And uh, yeah, just feel free to contact us anytime you want. Yeah. And if you missed any part of this talk, uh, we all, like like I said, we also went live on YouTube. So the recording of this entire uh, presentation is going to be there. You can refer to it or, or go watch it later. If you have any questions for us, if you have any questions for Early Bird, you can write to us at earlybird at ncf-india.org. That's our email ID. And uh, I would finally uh, like to thank Isha again for taking the time and talking about something so unique, something so different, um, something that's there and sparks curiosity, but you know, we don't really know a lot about. So thank you for opening that window for a lot of us. And thank you to everyone here for joining and being so patient and inquisitive. Uh, Please stay in touch. This is the first webinar in a series of a couple of more webinars that we'll do over the rest of the year. So stay in touch. And thank you everyone for joining. See you. Yeah, see you.